All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate's mission, uh, our vision, excuse me, we envision an ATE community in which evaluation is valued, systematic, and used to improve the education of technicians in high tech fields. We do this by engaging the ATE community with information, expertise, and tools to advance high quality evaluation. The slides and resources are already available on Evaluate, Evaluate's site, and you can access these by following the link on the right side of your screen. Uh, I will go ahead and email you the recording and another link to the resources in a few days. My name is Samantha Hooker. I'm the marketing specialist for Evaluate, and I'll be the moderator of today's webinar. Lissa wilson Betcho will be our presenter. She's the principal investigator of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We want to thank members of our team who help behind the scenes. Maureen Green, Lori Wingate, and our copy editor, Carolyn williams Norin. We also want to thank Ellen House, Elizabeth Hawthorne, Blake Erbach, Elaine Kraft, Pam Silvers, and Emery DeWitt for their feedback. <clears throat> this webinar is designed for individuals funded by the NSF NSF's ATE program. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering, IT, nanotechnologies, and more. And this is a great point to uh, point out that although we are funded by NSF, the views in this presentation are those of the presenter and not necessarily those of the National Science Foundation. And now I'm going to hand it over to Lissa. Thanks, Samantha. Well, hello, everyone. It is so good to, well, I can see that you're here, even though I cannot see you, but you can see me. Um, I know I met a lot of you who are involved in the FORCE ATE project um, a few weeks ago. So I am so glad that you are back to learn more about evaluation and how it really can benefit your ATE proposal and then your ATE project after you are funded. So we have a lot to talk about today. I'm gonna to go ahead and actually turn our cameras off so that you can focus on the slides, but we will turn them back on during the question answer session to remind you that Samantha and I are real people here live with you today. So um, like I said, we have a lot that we want to go over today, but just to begin with, I wanna check in with you about where you're at uh, thinking about evaluation because we know that sometimes the term evaluation the idea of of integrating an evaluation into a proposal you know people bring some assumptions some feelings sometimes some baggage with them into the conversations about evaluation and that is completely fair but i would like to know what you're all bringing in with you to today's webinar so to start off with, use the chat box, which is on the right side of your screen, if you haven't found it already, and share one word that comes to mind when you hear evaluation. So just one word, no judgments, don't hold back, good or bad, I wanna hear it all. All right, ooh, John, I love it, intentional. Assessment, feedback, required data, <laughs> metrics, results, learn. I love that, Linda, thank you. Impact, effectiveness, did it work? That's a great one. Not a word though. <laughs> Accountability, improvement, reflection. That's such a great one, Amy. Improvement, outcomes, unknown, recommendations. That's a good one too. Whew, well, to start off with, I am really glad that no one has like words like, terrifying or I don't want to do this um, and that's okay if you do it's okay if that's what you're feeling but you didn't feel like sharing um, but it, it all sounds like you're starting in a really great place probably with a lot of information about evaluation already which is great um, I have to tell you that I do have one primary goal for today and that is for you to all walk away from this webinar with a more hopeful positive outlook 
on what program evaluation can do for you and why you want to partner with your evaluation team for the sake of your students, your faculty, and your project. So as many of you today might be like my friend Jen here. So meet Jen Generickson. Um, yes, she is a fictional character and this is a fictional project and resemblance to any actual persons or projects is just coincidental. But she has a great idea for an ATE proposal. She's working with her colleagues to pull together specifics about her activities and her work plan. So she's in preparation. She is reading the ATE solicitation when she comes across the section on evaluation. So it states that all ATE funded work must be evaluated. So she's never had an NSF grant before, and she's not entirely sure what this means. In fact, she has a lot of questions like, what is evaluation? Why should she do it? How much is this going to cost her project? Who can serve as the evaluator of her project? Where is she going to find that person? So in today's webinar, I intend to answer all of these questions and any other questions that come up for you along the way. So please feel free to actively use the chat box throughout today's webinar. We're gonna have a few um, intentional question answer breaks, uh, but both Samantha and Maureen are closely monitoring the chat to flag those. So we'll, we'll absolutely come back to that. So a quick caveat today is part one of a two-part series of evaluation webinars for people in this pre-award stage where they're developing an ATE proposal. So today is an introduction, an overview, kind of like a quick start guide to what you need to know about evaluation as prospective grantees, grants professionals, or maybe administrators. And then on July 24th in part two, we're gonna dive into more of the details and specifics about how precisely to write an evaluation plan. So exactly what do you include, right? What should I put in there? But in both webinars, what I wanna do is connect you back to a wealth of resources on the Evaluate website so that when you inevitably have a question about evaluation later down the road, you know where to find answers. Caveat number two, as hopefully most of you know who are looking at developing an AT proposal, um, that a new solicitation is going to be released ahead of this year's AT submission deadline. So this, the solicitation that is up right now has expired. Its last submission date was in 23. So we are anticipating a new one to come out actually in the next few weeks. Um, and so there may be some changes as that comes out, but I will say that I've had multiple conversations with Celeste Carter, who is the director of the ATE program about evaluation within the program and NSF's respect for evaluation's value and the importance has not changed. So the majority, the foundation of the information that you're gonna hear today will not change. So let's start with the fundamental question of what is evaluation? So at its core, evaluation is a process of learning. Program evaluation can help to answer questions like, did my project work, right? Why did it work? Who did it work for? Are the project impacts equitable? And how can this be improved? So learning from an evaluation should really be driven by you, the project staff, and those that are served by the project. So this might be students or faculty, business and industry partners. Um, it can, sorry, I lost my spot. So it can even be helpful to ask these groups what they might want to know about your project. So we're gonna continue to talk about this, but in the best evaluations, it's truly a partnership between the project team and the evaluation team. Your evaluators are there to be your partners in learning. They're not there to catch you doing something wrong. They're not there to mark you down or point out flaws. They're not auditors, right? They're not there to conduct a performance review. They are there to work with you to make your project better for the sake of your project and ultimately for the students, right? So there are no failed projects. Just like any type of science experiment, there are no bad data. 
all data are a chance for learning, for improvement. So unmet project goals are an opportunity to understand what didn't work. And knowing what didn't work is a step closer to knowing what does work. Okay, so what does all of this look like in practice? Well, boiled down, evaluation involves four main steps. So the first is asking important questions about a project's process, outcomes, or other dimensions. So this is about making sure that the evaluation focuses on the things that really matter. This is where your project's learning desires come in. So these questions really scope the rest of the evaluation. The next step is gathering evidence that will help to answer those questions. So evidence for evaluation is often gathered using research methods, things like focus groups or interviews, surveys or observations. In the ATE program, evaluation often uses a college's institutional data quite often. Sometimes they might use results from course evaluations and sometimes include feedback from panels of experts or advisors. So then we have to make sense of all that data, right? We got all of it, but now we want to interpret the results so that we get a meaningful answer to our original questions. When it comes to interpreting or making meaning of the data that was collected, evaluations almost always look for project strengths and weaknesses. In assessing outcomes, we should determine the magnitude or the extent of the outcomes and their practical significance for the people involved. So this is often done by comparing to some sort of standard or benchmark. And then the last step is to use this information for project improvement, accountability, and planning. So the use of evaluation findings for decision-making is a key part of this evaluation cycle. So I said it's the final step, but it's not really, right? Because evaluation should then inform decisions about the next project, and this cycle of learning starts over again. Okay, so now Jen has a better sense of what it means to have her project evaluated, but she's still unsure of why she should do it. So why should she evaluate her project? Why should she want to evaluate her project? Well, I said it before and I'll say it again, but evaluation is all about learning. So we typically talk about three main benefits that come from evaluations. First, learning about what works and what doesn't work in order to improve your project. Second, sharing those learnings back with NSF. So as your funder, NSF also wants to learn what changes have happened because of their investment in your project. And third, providing evidence of the effectiveness of your project, both for your project and for others who might be trying to do something really similar. So evidence of what works can add to the larger field of technician training. So let's look at that first purpose, improvement. So a maxim we hear frequently, and I know uh, Blake used in her presentation at the Force ATE workshop, which is wonderful, is the most important purpose of evaluation is not to prove, but to improve. So whereas research is typically conducted for the sake of building knowledge, Evaluation is intended to inform decision making. So again, this first purpose of evaluation is for improvement of your project and to inform decision making. So this sense of this idea of utility, the usefulness of an evaluation is actually a standard of quality which evaluations are judged against. So evaluation findings are intended to be used. I keep saying that, you know, and I realize that that phrase using your evaluation doesn't always make sense to people who are new to evaluation or who are non-evaluators. So let's look at some examples of how um, this might look like in some example projects. So in our first example, evaluation findings, they might have highlighted a particular effective recruitment strategy, something that worked really well of getting women into a cybersecurity program at a college. And so after they see that data, the project decide, decides to really lean into this success and they take, they shift additional resources from their project into this recruitment strategy so that they can do more of that. In a second example, the project evaluator might share that faculty in a professional development workshop, 
they had a particularly difficult time understanding a unit on semiconductors. So this information might be a red flag that indicates that the project might want to revisit that unit about semiconductors and give some additional instructions so that faculty can really understand that concept more. And for a final example, evaluations can be particularly important in highlighting issues of equity and inclusion around a project's impact. So for example, an intern program funded by a project might be particularly helpful for white students, but when interviewed, Hispanic students talk about how they don't feel a sense of belonging to the program and they feel like they can't fully engage with the industry partners. So this kind of evaluation data is a really great insight into what's really happening and gives the project a chance to address that. So evaluation can unearth these patterns and give you an understanding of what you might want to change in your project and why. Okay, so the second purpose, accountability. So as a future funder of your project, NSF does require an independent evaluation. So in order to be in compliance with the requirements for your ATE project, you must evaluate it. So the second purpose here again is for that sense of accountability. But just like you want to learn about the effectiveness of your project, so does NSF. So at a basic level, evaluation enables a high degree of accountability. Individual grantees are held accountable for their use of federal funds, and the information helps NSF be accountable to Congress to justify the continued support of a program. So projects funded by the NSF have to submit annual reports through an online system called research.gov. So here on my little computer screen, you can see um, a recreation of what those main report sections look like. So there's this section called um, accomplishments. And in that section, grantees are going to then report on their project goals, activities, results, and outcomes. So evidence, evidence from your evaluation of your project results and outcomes are going to come right from your evaluation. And this is a really important thing that you wanna make sure to include in your future reports because your program officer is going to expect you to upload your evaluation report into this section, but they're also looking for you to react to your evaluation findings. They wanna know what you learned and then what you did with that information. So if you made any changes in your project, your evaluation findings could be one way that you justify those changes. So there's another section in the report called changes or problems. So if a project encounters problems or opportunities, right, to shift a project's focus a bit, to maximize their outcomes, evidence to substantiate that change in their plans can include, um, can include findings from the evaluation in this section. So I know you're all at this proposal stage right now, and you might be thinking, why are you sharing information about reports before I've even been funded? But here is just to remind you that your evaluation and integrating it throughout your proposal, throughout your project is going to come in handy when you have to do these annual reports. You're gonna find those evaluation findings in your evaluator a really valuable resource to make sure that you are answering what your program officer wants to know. So the third purpose of, evalu of evaluation is for evidence. So we hear a lot about evidence-based practices or high impact practices in education. So we trust that systematic research and evaluation of these evidence have, of these efforts have provided evidence that they work, right? So just as you borrow from others successful interventions, one day someone else might borrow from yours. So your evaluation provides evidence of what works and what doesn't work, both equally important learning opportunities. So I like this cartoon here where two people are talking and one person just asks, so did it work? <laughs> so another reason that you're going to want evidence of your project's outcomes is if you apply for a future grant. Um, so 
When you go back to NSF to ask for funds for another grant, your proposal will start with a section called results from prior NSF support. So perhaps you may have to already write that section if you are not new to receiving NSF funding. So this subsection, again, it has to include evidence of specific outcomes and results, including metrics to demonstrate the impact of the project's activities. Again, this comes from your evaluation, right? So it's important to consider at the start of your project, what kind of evidence you might want to have at the end of your project. So I wanna use this results of prior support to look at an example. So here are three sets of statements that could show up in a results of prior support section in a future proposal that Jen might submit. I want you to take your time and read these examples carefully and then use the poll, um, which is going to show up on the right side of your screen, but you can use the poll to indicate which examples would be the most compelling to reviewers of that proposal as evidence of outcomes. So Samantha, can you go ahead and launch that poll so that it shows up for everyone in the polls tab? Oh, let me see. I can go ahead and do that. Okay, so that poll should show up for you now. But again, look at these examples. Put yourself in the shoes of a reviewer. Which is the most compelling description of outcomes, of evidence of a project? Okay, I see the majority of people with us today have answered. So you should be able to see the responses to the poll, but it looks like about 93% have chosen example C. Yeah, so let's just look at these for a second. So in example A, they only really said what they were funded to do. Right, so Celeste Carter, the ATE program lead, actually says that this is really common in ATE proposals, that people just kind of cut and paste from their prior, prior proposal. But saying what they intended to do, you know, it's not really um, compelling evidence that they did those things of outcomes of their prior projects, right? So not example A. So in example B, it really only reports activities, right? So it has a lot of numbers, which are great, 150 students enrolled, 300 students benefited, 400 potential students, but these are just counts of what happened, right? There isn't actually any evidence of what happened to the students as a result of these activities. But when we look at example C, we see that this really answers that question of so what? Right? So what happened to those students after they participated? Well, their pass rate increased, they got jobs. So it includes evidence of what changes were brought about because of the project. So this is the kind of evidence, these are the kinds of descriptions of outcomes that you want to focus on in when you're planning for your evaluation. Okay, so now I want you to think about your own proposal. So maybe the one that you're currently developing, maybe one that you uh, have right now. But imagine your proposal is successful and you've been funded by the NSF ATE program. Imagine you're in the last year of your ATE grant. What is one thing that you want to be able to say about the success of your project? So take a minute to think about that one thing would be and share it in the chat box.
Yeah, so Jasenia said degree of impact, but what kind of impact is that? We'll unpack that impact a little bit. Tiffany says student completion. Yeah, and really thinking about what does that mean, student completion, right? Is that degree obtainment? Is that uh, completing a certain number of credits? Because that can be different for different programs, different projects, different institutions. An increase of graduation rates, retention rates, right? People go there, but then we want to we want them to stay. Change in knowledge, yeah, that's a good one too. Joel says student placement and jobs or internships. Absolutely, I think especially in the ATE, right? Like, how are we serving the needs of workforce, business, industry partners? Students gaining gained learning complex science contents. Absolutely. So really being specific, yeah, right? Maybe not just increase knowledge, but increase knowledge in what? In your proposal, I think that that's what reviewers are going to be looking for. Were we effective in placing students? Absolutely. Student confidence. That's a great one too, Tiffany. Wonderful. Yeah. So it's a really great thing to keep in the back of your head to say like, this is the things that we want to be able to say about our efforts, about our work, right? And make sure that you're constantly reminding yourself that that's what your evaluation is working towards. So if you wanna know more about what goes in to this results from prior support section, and you wanna write a good one, go ahead and check out our checklist on this topic. So it includes the NSF requirements plus suggestions from Evaluate on getting the most out of this section. So even if you're just thinking about submitting your first proposal, it's not too early to start thinking about how you wanna be able to talk about your accomplishments with this project in the future. Okay, so now Jen has a good grasp on what evaluation is, what it looks like in practice, and why she wants to do it. But of course, her big question is what it's going to cost her, pro her project. But before we dive into that question, we're going to take a break to answer any questions that might have popped up for you in the moment. So I'm going to turn our cameras back on and hand it over to Samantha. Thank you, Lissa. And yes, as Lissa said, please go ahead and put any questions in the chat box as we go through. I'll go ahead and mark those and make sure that we're addressing them during our question breaks. Um, Lissa, while we wait for people to drop a couple questions in there, I do know a very frequent question we get um, that might be good to address. <clears throat> uh, what is the difference between assessment and evaluation? Absolutely. So the term assessment is used quite frequently in education, right? And most often we hear assessment used in terms of measuring students' learning, right? So this could be in a classroom. You know, we hear a formative assessment where we're making sure um, students are learning along the way. Um, assessment in terms of standardized testing, right? You're all really familiar with this. And so there is certainly an overlap with assessment and evaluation, right? Assessment could be part of an evaluation, but in a project level evaluation or even in a program level evaluation, we're really taking that step up and we're looking at a more holistic view of things. So not just student learning, but what were these larger outcomes? What was the larger impact of this initiative, right? So really thinking about whatever that project is as this intervention of something that wouldn't have happened without um, that funding, without that project happening. So often, you know, you're really looking at bigger um, indicators, right? Bigger outcomes, just uh, along the lines of a lot of the things that you all mentioned in the chat. Okay, thank you. And can you tell us, is qualitative or quantitative uh, methods better? <laughs> what a loaded question. Is quantitative or qualitative methods better, right? So we're saying our numbers, our stories better. I mean, you know my answer is going to be neither is better. But I also want to say that NSF, ATE, program officers and reviewers, they are not looking for one over the other. I think there may be some false assumptions out there that something like the National Science Foundation wants really like heavy quantitative evaluation, right? They're really looking for the numbers. Um, at the end of the day, 
pretty much no ATE program is going to have the funding, the budget, the time, the resources available to do anything close to an experimental design or quasi-experimental design, which are heavily quantitative approaches to evaluation within the span of their three-year project. And so that's really not what reviewers are looking for. What they are looking for is to use a mix of the numbers and the stories, quantitative and qualitative, to build a story, to make sure that you're understanding that evidence, what's happening in your project, and that it's useful back to the project. So really back to that use of project improvement for the data, right? It's about answering the questions that are important to your project and to your team. Yeah, Usila wrote in the chat, I found quant and qual can complement one another. Absolutely. So we very frequently find that ATE evaluations are mixed methods. Okay, and one last one, barring any additional questions being entered into the chat. Um, what is considered good, and I'm gonna put quotes there, what is considered good evaluation? Absolutely. There is no one standard evaluation plan that is like the, you know, gold standard evaluation plan for, for an ATE project, right? Like, it's particularly within the ATE program in NSF, they're really looking for evaluations that meet the information needs of the project. There are other programs out there that will top down from the funder standpoint, require certain indicators, certain methods, certain things to be collected and shared, but that's not the case in ATE. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the project is the primary audience for evaluation reports. So thinking about what good evaluation is, it's something that's not just done to be a, a, a checkbox, right? It's not just something that you do because, oh, you have to do it and you have to give it to your program officer, right? The intended reader of that, the beneficiary of your evaluation report is the project, is the PI, the co-PI, the rest of the project staff, when then the beneficiary of the students, the faculty that are then impacted by the project. While your program officer is going to read your evaluation report and is interested in the evidence, they are not the primary users, right? And what they want out of your evaluation is for it to be useful to you. So remember, at the end of the day, a good ATE evaluation is something that is useful to the project. Okay, thank you. And that is our last question for this break so far. So I think we're ready to All move right. on. I think everyone's always anxious to hear about the cost question, right? So let's jump into that. All right, so as a reminder, we do have another question break coming up. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat at any point in time. Okay, so again, back to this question that I frequently find is on the mind of people developing proposals. How much is this project evaluation going to cost? So here's an excerpt from the current ATE program solicitation about the evaluation requirement. So it states that the evaluation budget must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. And that's really important, but I know it's not exactly satisfying for people who just want to get a number into their budget that they can work with. So the general rule of thumb is that 10% of a project's costs should be allocated for evaluation. And that's evaluation in any context, beyond ATE, beyond NSF, we, we see this kind of 10% rule of thumb. So that's a good place to start. And then you can go up or down from there. So sometimes I hear between eight and 12%, right? But again, it's really dependent on the level of evaluation that's needed for your project. So a variety of factors could influence a project's budget. So I just wanna share with you some examples of things that may make your evaluation more expensive or less expensive. But again, it all depends on what the project is looking for, what kinds of things you wanna learn. So the first thing that kind of influences an evaluation budget is the type of data that you'll be collecting, right? We kind of just talked about this, quantitative, qualitative, right? But an evaluation that is really heavily um, qualitative, the data tends to be more time intensive when it comes to collecting it, cleaning it, and analyzing it. 
So sometimes we see that evaluations that more heavily rely on qual qualitative data can be more expensive. But as we talked about, we very often see that mixed methods so kind of in the middle of this. So another factor is whether or not the data has already been collected or whether it will be newly collected. So sometimes evaluations can use existing data and that data can be less time consuming for the evaluation team compared to when they need to gather that new data, right? So new, uh, collecting new data can make an evaluation more expensive. Different evaluators interact with projects differently. So if you're looking for an evaluator who's going to be highly responsive to changes in your project's activities, timelines, or data needs, that might be more costly than say a rigid, less responsive evaluation. The level of engagement from your evaluator can also influence the cost of an evaluation. An evaluator who is more involved with meetings or decision-making, that's going to be more time, right? Which of course is going to cost more. So there are elements of support by project staff that can help uh, in evaluation efforts. So sometimes we call this like internal evaluation efforts. So the more a project can um, support the evaluation, it can reduce the burden on your external evaluation, external evaluation team, making for a less costly evaluation. And then of course, travel time, right? So a lot of evaluators do do in-person site visits to projects, although I've seen that change a little bit um, with COVID and, and virtual visits, but there's still something really important on seeing a project in action, meeting people in person. So um, longer travel times can lead to a higher budget. So if you're really looking to be more budget conscious, um, it might be beneficial to look for an evaluator in your area. Although I do not think that there is any impact on the quality of an evaluator if you go, you know, say across the country or something. So, you know, I want to share all of these not as a formula to write your evaluation budget, but as some guideposts to understand that that 10% rule of thumb might be affected by the type of evaluation your project is looking for. So it's always best to have an open conversation with your evaluator about your needs and their needs upfront. The fact of the matter is, if evaluation is gonna bring value to your project, you have to fund it adequately. So let's look at what this might mean in practice. So remember our friend Jen, well, let's say that she is going to apply for the maximum amount for projects funded through the track one, a small new to ATE, program. So her total budget would be $350,000 over three years. So most academic institutions will apply an indirect cost to this. Um, sometimes I hear it called a, a facilities and administration rate, FNA, but most often it's an indirect cost. And so the institution rates uh, vary widely across institutions, but let's say that Jen's institutional indirect rate is 25%. So that means that $70,000 of her total budget would be made up of indirect funds, leaving $280,000 of the budget for direct operating funds. So as a reminder, the 10% rule of evaluation is calculated based on the direct operating budget. So if Jen decides to dedicate 10% in her direct budget to evaluation, that would mean that there would be $28,000 over the lifespan of the grant, which would be $9,333 per year. So these funds would go towards the evaluator's time, as well as their travel expenses and overhead costs. There might be some other miscellaneous expenses in here, but these are really the main ones. And so your evaluator budget should really reflect what's needed for your given project. So again, this is a really rough um, guideline. So Jen is on her way to understanding what evaluation is and how much it costs. Um, I do, normally we have a question break here, but I'm actually, I wanna keep going. So I wanna make sure we get through all of this content. I know that there are some questions in the chat, but we have another question break. But make sure if you have any questions about cost, 
on the top of your mind. Go ahead and put them in the chat now so you don't forget. Because I want to make sure we talk about who can do this project level evaluation, right? Because Jen, she has a lot of smart people on her team. And so she's just wondering if they can do it internally. And the short answer to that is no, because the ATE program specifically states that the evaluator must be independent of the project. So the first question we should tackle is what counts as independent? Well, according to the ATE program solicitation, the evaluator can be employed by a project's home institution as long as they work in a separate unit that has a different reporting line than the project's home unit. So this might be something like a different academic department or like an institutional research office. While some larger institutions might have evaluation capacity in other departments, this can become practically impossible at smaller institutions. NSF asks for the evaluator to be independent in order to provide a sense of objectivity and validity to the findings. So sometimes you're just gonna have to do a gut check. You know, can this person objectively evaluate my project? Is there gonna be any incentive for them to sway the results in one way or another? If you're on the fence, you're not sure with that gut check, it's really better to go with someone outside your institution. So an evaluator from outside your institution and project, they're gonna have the highest level of independence. They're gonna be able to tell you like it is without fear of any political ramifications from their administrators. So sometimes it can feel really difficult to find an evaluator that's right for your project particularly some of those smaller or new to AT projects get um, even trickier. But when looking for an evaluator, it's important to know that there's no specific degree or certification that is required to call yourself an evaluator. But there are a wide variety of companies and organizations that do conduct project level evaluations. Some of these are small evaluation co consultants, Others are large evaluation centers, sometimes even based at four-year institutions or larger research conglomerates. So here are some things to think about when you are searching for that evaluator. So first, you want to be careful to look for someone who has experience as an evaluator, someone who has strong research skills, someone who's a good communicator and who will be responsive to your situation, it can also be helpful for someone to have an understanding of NSF projects or the two-year community college context. So for new to ATE projects, it could be particularly helpful to have an evaluator who's had prior experience evaluating ATE projects. So it's not always easy to find someone with this kind of perfect mix of credentials. So sometimes you have to do some investigating. So Let's help Jen select an evaluator for her project. So we're gonna go ahead and, and launch a poll in the second, but take a few minutes to read over, review the credentials of these three example evaluators, and then use the poll that is on the right side of your screen to mark your recommendation about which one Jen should approach for her project. And if you have any reservations or additional questions that you might want to ask that evaluator, go ahead and use the chat box to explain any of your concerns. All right, I see a little over half of people have responded. So we have about 5% of our audience who would recommend evaluator A, 74% for evaluator B, and 22% for evaluator C. So let's look at some of these a little bit more closely. 
you know, I mentioned that sometimes it can be really difficult to tell if an evaluator is a good fit from their resume alone. And sometimes, a lot of the times, follow-up questions can be really helpful. So when I look at evaluator A, they seem to have some good knowledge about two-year colleges, technician education, and student services. So then I would want to know more about their experience as an external evaluator of grant-funded projects. Accreditation, you know, it has a lot in common with project evaluation, but it's not exactly the same thing. So you'd want to ask them, you know, what's your experience with project evaluation? Evaluator B looks like they have some great credentials when it comes to evaluation, but I would also want to know how much time they would really have to work on this project. So given that they're working with 25 other evaluations, I would expect that they would be working with a larger team. So I'd want to know who would actually be working on my project and what their specific credentials are. So they say they have prior experience with NSF funded projects. I would ask them, do you have experience with ATE in particular or other projects that are based at two-year institutions? And then evaluator C, they certainly know two-year colleges and NSF, but it's not clear if they have experience when it comes to research methods or running evaluations. So I would certainly ask about those things. Yeah, I see Julia mentioned in the comment that B might be a little bit overextended, which would limit their responsiveness, right? Absolutely. Those are good questions to ask, good things to really consider. So it's rare to find that perfect evaluator based on their resume alone. So it's always good to follow up with questions and ask for additional information. So to really help with this, we've pulled together a list of questions that you might want to ask evaluators when determining which one's the right fit for you. As an evaluator should fit your project and your team in multiple ways not only their skills in evaluation, but also their working style and how they approach the evaluation. The more you feel like you connect with your evaluator, the better potential for the evaluation. So now that Jen has a better idea of who she might be looking for, she wants to know where does she find them, right? So at Evaluate, we've actually done some research around this, and most ATE projects actually find their evaluator through word of mouth. So make sure that you ask colleagues and other ATE PIs that you know if they have an evaluator that they like. But I also know that that answer isn't helpful for everyone. So um, unfortunately, at this exact moment, we do not currently have a master list of all the possible evaluators for your ATE project. However, we do have some good suggestions on where you might find an evaluator that meets your needs. So our first suggestion is the American Evaluation Association. So they have a national directory of evaluators and you can search this directory. So I would really suggest using terms like STEM, education, community college, or even NSF. The American Evaluation Association also has local affiliate groups. So these are regional groups and sometimes they have their own directory that can list people that are not included in the national directory. So again, I mentioned while an evaluator doesn't have to be local to your area, sometimes it can cut down on that travel cost in your evaluation budget or maybe increase their awareness of local needs. Expanding the Bench is an initiative committed to diversifying evaluation and ev elevating culturally responsive and equitable evaluation. So they also have a searchable database of evaluators. So similar to the AEA database, I would recommend using those search terms like STEM, education, community college to find the right person. And then of course, ATE Central hosts a map of evaluators who are currently evaluating ATE projects. So this is a partnership between Evaluate and ATE Central. And Maureen actually has done a wonderful job recently to make sure that this map is the most updated we can get it. So there are evaluator profiles on there that list information like their company name, contact information, but it also lists the ATE projects that they've evaluated and the STEM disciplines. And if they are accepting new clients, there should be a little checkbox on their profile. Because I know that can be frustrating when you reach out to someone and they just say, I'm sorry, I'm not accepting a new client. So this is also a great resource for finding someone to work with. 
So when you get to this stage where you're ready to find and select an evaluator for your project, take a look at Evaluate's guide to finding and selecting an evaluator. So this is in the resource booklet that you can download on page four. But this is a really great summary of information that I've given to you today, as well as additional information. So now everything I just said about finding an evaluator assumes that you are able to start looking for that evaluator now before you're funded. But this process of procuring an evaluator can be a little bit more difficult depending on your institution's policies. So I wish I could give you a really straightforward map of what this looks like at your particular institution, but it is different in each state and sometimes in each institution. So we highly recommend that one of your first conversations is with someone in your procurement or contracts office, and they should be able to tell you more specifics about your institution. But to give you an overview of kind of two basic paths, right? The first path, your institution will allow you to work with an evaluator pre-award, meaning right now while you're developing your proposal. So this can be a really great way to connect and have your evaluator really inform the full development of your project's um, goals and objectives, as well as the proposal. The second path, in the second path, your institution might say that you need to wait until the project is funded in order to work with an evaluator. So this means that you're not, you won't be able to work with an external evaluator while you write your evaluation plan. So you or someone on your project team are gonna have to write it. So while this may seem really overwhelming, we know that a lot of other ATE program projects are in a similar boat. And Evaluate has a lot of resources that can support you with this. So first we have a resource that looks at, the, at navigating the evaluator procurement process, right? So this is a guide that can really help you ask questions to understand when and how you can start working with an evaluator. And second, evaluate, we have a checklist for what content should be included in your evaluation plan for your ATE proposal. So this information is exactly what we are going to dive into in our next webinar um, on July 24th, I believe. It's on a slide in a second. But I want to give you this checklist here and now in case you're ready to get started. But know that we're going to talk through each and every point on this checklist in detail in a few weeks. All right. Well, Jen is feeling pretty good about evaluation now, and I hope you are too. So we are going to have one more question break. Make sure we answer all of your questions. I'll hand it over to Samantha. Thank you, Lissa. Um, first question, at what point do you evaluate? Absolutely, that is a great question. So once your project is funded, I would say at every point, right? There is a role for evaluators and evaluation at every point of your project from the planning and development phase all the way through the reporting phase. Um, we are going to dive into that a little bit more deeply in the next webinar, so I hope that you can join. Thank you. And we did have a question about um, budget. And the question is, do I have to pay my evaluator during the proposal stage? That is a good question. So I will say it depends. Um, there are a lot of evaluators who will work without um, fees or payment in that pre-award stage to develop the evaluation plan with the understanding that they're going to be hired on as the evaluator for that project if funded. So some evaluators just view that as, you know, kind of how things work and take on that cost into their estimates. Other evaluators will ask for some payment during that that plant, that stage, right, to make that evaluation plan to have those meetings. Um, so just make sure that you're talking to your evaluator up front, ask them those types of questions, and ask if they set any type of time boundary around um, the work that they'll do in the pre-award stage. Okay, thank you. Um, William is wondering, and if, if the evaluator is working off of data provided by the PIs, how does that maintain accountability in NF, NSF's view? Um, and maybe some tips into a productive and communicative relationship with their evaluator? 
Yeah, William, this is a great question. So it really depends on what kind of data we're talking about, right? So if we are saying that the PI is providing data like institutional student records, right? Like those are pretty reliable data sources, even though they were provided by the PI. Um, but there is a sense that the evaluator can then go in and collect new information, right? Whether that's doing surveys in which it's fully run by the evaluator, the project team, you know, doesn't have access to that, doesn't, um, isn't involved in, in a way that might bias those responses. Um, whether they're doing interviews, they're really talking to people, right? But, you know, the sense that you, you say in here that you have an evaluator for another project, not ATE, but you, you're you know kind of worried that they're not adding much beyond what the team can do. I think that's a conversation that you need to have with your evaluator, right? And be really honest to say, like, this isn't serving the needs of our project. And I think the evaluator, I hope that the evaluator is gonna be really receptive to that and saying, what can we change? What can we do differently, right? Because again, you don't wanna feel like you're paying someone to do something that you could do internally, right? They're really supposed to be a learning partner there to help you understand and help you advance your project.